this morning. I wonder who's glad to be in the house of the Lord today. Come on, put your hands together. Lift up a shout. You saw me. You loved me. You knew me before time began. Where I'd go, you are with me. And I'm safe in the palm of your hand. Come on, sing it with me. You saw me. You loved me. You knew me. You knew me. Where I go, where I go, you are with me. I'm saving the palm of your hand. Come on, sing it out in my fear. In my fear, you're here with me. You're here with me. You're here with me. In the dark, you still see. Sing it with you say, Lord. Lord, you reign over all. Sovereign God.
together. Let's welcome Jesus in the building. Hallelujah. We honor you and praise you. We exalt you, oh God. There is none like you. The psalmist said, this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. That's a decision of the will. It has nothing to do with your mood or your emotions. He said, I got another day. I know it's a gift from God, so I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to celebrate what God has done for me. What most people get wrong in a church service is in, in worship, we celebrate who we are through Christ. Okay? So we're an heir. We're a joint heir. We're forgiven. We're washed. We're indwelt. We're beloved. Okay? But what the enemy would like to do is make you concentrate on what you failed to do this week during worship. Okay? And steal your worship away because he would make your worship about you and your performance and not God and his. Okay? In the altar... We deal with what we are not. So there's a time for that. Don't get it mixed up. In worship, we celebrate what God has made us through the atonement and the resurrection and the indwelling. We are heirs and joint heirs. We are ambassadors. We are a royal priesthood, right? We are his chosen generation, a holy nation. He made us that. He gave that to us by His grace, and we celebrate that. If you fail and skit your knee morally this week, we got salve for that. But that's in the altar, not during worship. Okay? If you didn't pray like you thought you should have, you could take care of that in the altar. Okay? If you made a mistake and bit somebody's head off, you can ask for forgiveness in the altar. Don't get it twisted. Don't let the enemy steal your worship. Because worship is powerful. The psalmist says, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. You want to know what silence is the enemy of your life? Worship and praise. Silences. The enemy and the accuser of the brethren. So lift up your voice and give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, we want to thank you if you're joining us online. We're glad you're here. God can minister to you right where you are. If you're a guest, let's give all of our guests a hand today. We're glad that you are here. Welcome, welcome. We're honored that you chose to celebrate with us. On the back of your seat and on the screen, there's a QR card code. Just take a picture of it. It will take you to our online guest card. We just want to get to know you. We're not going to bug you or bother you. We just want to get to know you and your story. Amen. Today, immediately after the service, is first steps. Everybody say first steps. All right, so if you're interested in knowing more about Northgate and you've already attended our Connect Lunch, we invite you immediately after the service, out those doors to the left is our First Steps class. And so we will get to know more about our culture. You'll get to know your purpose and find your people and your place to minister. Amen. Also, on 428 of this month, the 28th of this month is Baptism Sunday. Amen. So, small group leaders, I need your help here, okay? Community group leaders. If you have anyone in your small group or community group, just ask them, have you been baptized before? If not, this is a great opportunity to get them to take a step of faith in Christ on Baptism Sunday. Hallelujah. And then on March the 5th, no, that's probably not right. We were already past March. How did that happen? Probably May the 5th. May the 5th is our single mothers conference. Okay? So if you know any single moms who are doing double duty and they want some encouragement and to be strengthened, 
then I want you to invite them on May the 5th. Uh, Sister Veronica Flores is going to be leading this up. It's going to be a great blessing to all of our moms. Let's give it up for single moms who do a great job. Amen. All right. On the 19th of this month is our volunteer banquet, okay? Everything that happens around here is because so many volunteer their time, their talent to give in many ways. And so what we do is we take one night a year and we celebrate our volunteers. Jesus said if you want to be great in the kingdom, he said you must become a servant. You know what that means? That greatness according to the kingdom definition is within reach of us all. It's not about the number of followers we have. It's not about our intelligence. It's that we find people to help and we help them. And Jesus said that is true greatness. And so on the 19th, we're going to celebrate all of our volunteers. Today is the last day to sign up if you'd like to go. If you volunteered in any capacity, if you volunteered once, you're welcome to come. Okay? But we're going to celebrate all of our volunteers. It's an award ceremony. And uh, we're going to give out some best volunteers hype man award it's going to be a fun night and you're going to get fed amen and the food is going to be off the chain it's going to be a diamond oaks country club hallelujah all right i got a testimony this morning as the ushers come once you be seated for a minute you're standing it's okay ushers are coming so i had a wonderful saint of god take me aside last sunday and tell me this incredible testimony, and I wanted to share it with all of you, okay? So, Sister Donna Bradley has been a part of Northgate since probably 2002 or 2001, maybe even, 2002. So, that's a long time, and she has been a faithful member of Northgate and uh, has given of her time and her talent, and she's a faithful giver to Northgate, one of the most generous givers here. And she has this incredible story because she was trained as a phlebotomist. That was her training. She was going to work in a lab and do all the tests on the blood. And she did that for a while. And then she had the opportunity to get into the computer side of things where she had little or no training at the time. But she has become one of the lead bosses in the computer department for John Peter Smith Hospital. And so she said, I have to tell you what happened this week. My boss came to me and he gave me over a $9 an hour raise. Huh? I don't know about you, but I don't hear that testimony. I hear 50 cents. I hear a dollar. I hear two or three dollars. But I don't hear $9. I'm here to tell you, if you will give and you will put God first, God will put you on his agenda and bless you, breast down, shaking together and running over. Hallelujah. Amen. Isn't that awesome? We celebrate with Sister Donna. We celebrate with her, and it's your opportunity. Because I can tell you something about Sister Donna is she's an incredible, faithful giver, okay? And what you do is you create a situation. The Bible says that if I give to the poor, that God is in my debt. And it's not that I'm calling my loan. Hey, remember when I helped that poor person? No, 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 no. I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. But God watches that and he blesses that and so I want to encourage you today I know you may be in a jam right now you may be in a jam financially maybe things are tight maybe there's more month than there's money I understand that been there done that okay but if you'll start somewhere if you'll start somewhere and say, God, this is what I can do right now. And be faithful with that. I promise you, in three to six months, things are going to turn around. Things are going to turn around. In Jesus' name. Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity to worship and give you praise. And we just ask that you bless the giver as they give. 
bless them, press down, shaken together. When they come and when they go, you said they'd be the head and not the tail, Lord God, that your blessing and your favor is on the generous, Lord. Let us do it with gratitude because of all that you've done for us in ways that we can't even count, Lord. And in Jesus' name, we pray a blessing on the giver and the offering. And everybody said amen. Would you stand and get ready to worship as you give? Good morning, church. Why don't we make our way to the front at this time?
above every name. The God that heals, the God that provides. The ones that do, are able to do more than we could ever imagine and ask or think.
God, that your presence is here so strong. God, we're not in a hurry, God, because when you show up, anything can happen. When you show up, we're not concerned about our program. When you show up, we're not concerned about our schedules. We're not concerned about our reservations. Because, God, we need you to show up in our situations, God. We need you to show up on our jobs. We need you to show up. And we believe that your presence here and the peace that we feel is indicating that you're doing something behind the scenes that only you can do. Hallelujah. 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 Surely the Lord is in this place. Hallelujah. I'm sure if we could see in the spirit, we'd see a ladder. We'd see a ladder from the floor to the heaven of God sending blessings to his people, God giving answers. I believe God's confirming some things in people's lives right now. Hallelujah, your glory is here. Your glory is here. Ha. Like Isaiah, I looked and saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. He's here, church. He's here. The presence of God is here. that that feels you know what it feels like it feels like God's doing something it feels like God's doing something even when I can't see it even when I can't feel it even when I got the email that seems like a nightmare and got news I wish I never would have gotten there's just something about coming in services like this that it confirms that God is doing something beyond what you can see Amen. I want to pause and say thank you to an amazing worship team and worship band that has followed after the presence of God, that were way more concerned with God's presence than they were any type of program, because that's why we come into this place. Amen. If you don't mind, just give me a tad more monitor up here. I appreciate it. If you have your Bibles, we'll be in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. We'll start in verse 25. And I will say that I want to put a little plug in immediately after service. If you are a creative or if you know a creative, nudge the person next to you if you know they're a creative. So if you like to be involved with event decor, videography, photography, social media, cameras, slides, anything involving something creative, there's a quick, everybody say quick. It's a quick meeting, I promise you. Out that door to your right, there's a creative team interest meeting. will be no longer than 20 minutes. That will be the max it would go. We'll go shorter than that, honestly. And it'll give you an opportunity to sign up for one of these teams that you can use your creative talents for the kingdom of God. We serve a creative God. And his people are creative as well. I'm excited. 
I feel like preaching here this morning. The hardest thing sometimes is when you're ready to preach and you're ready to preach the night before. And you're like, let's just go have church right now. I'll be in Acts 16, verse 25 through 34. But at midnight. Anybody feel like you're at midnight in a dark season? But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Just going to put a little cliff note in here. Be careful how you respond in the midst of a dark season. Because you're influencing somebody around you in the midst of your dark season. And you might think that nobody sees what you're going through, but someone's watching you. And based upon your response is going to determine if they get out of their dark season. That one's for free. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, everybody say immediately. Immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, he woke from his sleep. He saw the prison doors open. Got worried because he had assumed the prisoners had fled. So he drew his sword. He was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice. Do yourself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in fell down trembling before Paul and Silas and he brought them out and said sirs what must I do to be saved so they said believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved you and your household then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes the same man coming against them now is working for him and immediately he and all his family were baptized, which I want to pause and say, you noticed that Paul tells him to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When the man asks how to be saved, but also you see that you don't just stop with belief because if you do believe in Jesus Christ, you will be baptized in Jesus name. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. What are you going to preach about, Lavelle? I'm going to talk about earthquake entrances. Earthquake entrances. One more time, could we welcome the presence of God here? We love you, Jesus. We thank you for being so magnificent. You're the God that nothing surprises you. You're the God that when I get worried, you're not biting your fingernails. God, you're the God that I can go to sleep because you never slumber. God, the things that I don't plan for, you've already had a plan for. You're large. You're in charge. And I love you today, Jesus. If you love the Lord, could you clap your hands to him one more time as you're seated? And a little over a week ago, an earthquake struck near New York City on a Friday morning, shaking buildings up and down the East Coast. Residents surprised in this general area because it was rare that experiences such as this took place. People all the way from Baltimore to Boston reported feeling rumbling and shaking. It was one of the largest earthquakes on the East Coast in the last century. Luckily, no one was harmed, but it was something that had never happened in that century. What is an earthquake? It's intense shaking of Earth's surface caused by movements in Earth's outermost layer. Why? Do they happen? The earth is made of four basic layers, a solid crust, a hot, 
nearly solid mantle, a liquid inner core and a solid inner core. Although the earth looks like a pretty settled place from the surface, although the earth looks like a pretty settled place from your point of view, it's actually extremely active just below the surface. The location below the earth's surface where the earthquake starts is called the hypocenter. And when underground rock suddenly breaks and there is a rapid motion along a fault, an earthquake occurs. The cause or indication of our earthquake is that something is happening beyond what we can see. The cause or indication of an earthquake is something is happening beyond the surface. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we see a scriptural occurrence of an earthquake. It was as Elijah's dark place of discouragement that he comes to the mount of God where an earthquake occurs. It was Acts 16 that an earthquake shook the prison that the apostle Paul and Silas occupied. It was Matthew chapter 27 verse 50 where an earthquake coincided with the crucifixion. It said when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. But at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to the bottom. And the earth shook. Everybody say earthquake. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. And I believe the timing of these earthquakes in Scripture have significance, signaling and indicating of something in motion beyond the scene. I believe it's indicating the divine at work beyond the surface of what appears to the eye. Because if you've served God long enough, you know there's more than meets the eye. You know in the midst of trial, in the midst of testing, in the midst of destruction, God's doing something beyond what we could ever ask or think. Because Elijah ended up receiving a word of encouragement that 7,000 had not bowed their knee to Baal. Paul and Silas were eventually released from prison. Jesus went beneath the surface to the grave, took the keys of death, and redeemed mankind. Be careful how you interpret the earthquakes of life. Because what may seem like an exit could be an entrance. Peter encouraged us in his epistle to not think it strange when fiery trials and earthquakes happen because the very thing that appears as danger can be the very thing permitted in your life to deliver you. You see, Proverbs 25 verse 2 says, It's the glory of God to conceal. Everybody say conceal. To conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. Can I tell you something here this Sunday morning? His sovereignty is beyond my search. His plan can't be calculated. His glory can't be comprehended. He can't be out-strategized. His glory is uncontrollable. His ways are far above our ways. His thoughts are far above our thoughts. The f- The foolish things of God are wiser than human wisdom. The weakness of God is stronger than human strength. He's the lily of the valley. He's the God of the mountain. He's the God of the valley. And it doesn't matter where you're at in this place here this morning. God knows exactly where you are at. David said in Psalm 77, verse 19, your way is in the sea, your path in the great waters, but your footprints were not to be found. His sovereignty is at work beneath the surface. He, it moves us from death to life. And can I tell you, the same thing shaking our life is shaking open closed doors for you to enter into the next thing that God has in store for you life. What you couldn't open on your own, I just wonder if God is using an unexpected earthquake to catapult you, to have you enter into another dimension of glory. What has come? Nudge the person next to you and say, get ready. Look at the other person next to you and say, get ready. 
what has come into your life might seem like it's dangerous, but God has meant it for deliverance. There is something beyond the surface happening. There is something beyond what the eye can see. There's something beyond the trial. There's something beyond the problem. God is making a way where there seems to be no way. And I just wonder if there's about five to ten people here that can clap their hands and shout unto God and say, God, I am thankful that you're making a way where there seems to be no way. He's working behind the scenes. He's working behind what I can imagine. God is setting us up for something new. If one of the ushers could help me with some water, please. So we get to the context of our story. And it's Acts 16, and we see the Apostle Paul. And so let's give it up for LD. Thank you, LD. We see the Apostle Paul and Silas. They're in an in-between moment because they're in between bondage and being released. But they did what we have to do in the midst of a jail. They began to sing praises unto God. Because praise is the posture we must maintain to pass our way through. But while they begin to praise, an earthquake begins to happen. And there's three lessons I want to take out of what we can learn in this text. I, call, I say it like this. Three lessons from the earthquake. Number one, do not exit too soon. I know. That's probably not popular Sunday morning preaching when you're ready to get out of a situation. But don't exit too soon because we go to Acts 16 and we see that the prisoner, he was upset. He assumed that the prisoners were gone because all the doors were open. But although all the prison doors were open, all the prisoners were still in the jail. Now, I am assuming that Paul had something to do with that. That by his influence that he gained with those that were around him in the midst of that situation, he influenced them to not go beyond release before it is time. Because you cannot seek deliverance at the expense of your development. Every trial, every trial has an exit appointment. Everybody say, I have an appointment. You have an appointment with deliverance. You have an appointment for God to give you the answer that you're praying for. You have an appointment to get from where you're at to where God wants to take you to. But you don't want to get out of the situation you are in one second earlier than when God wants you to get out of it. You don't want to get the job one second earlier than you feel like you need it. You don't want to get the ministry position one second earlier than you feel like you need to have it. Because you do not want the stretching that God is permitting in your life to stop a second sooner. The polishing of your character. The working on your spirit. It's enlarging your capacity to be blessed. God wants to bless you. Everybody say, he wants to bless me. God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. God wants to open a door in your life, and he wants to do it more than you want the door to be open. But he has to shake some things under the surface to prepare you for what he wants to do in your life. I cannot go into a new place with an old mind. There are some Christians that our body has left Egypt, but our mind needs to come with us to Canaan. 
He has to shake away pride. He has to shake away insecurity. He has to shake away bitterness. He has to shake away inconsistency. He has to shake away controlling behavior. He has to shake away my fear. He has to shake away my jealousy so that my eyes might see and my hands apprehend what God has designed for me. Don't be discouraged in the shaking. The reward far outweighs the price. It's beyond what you can ever ask. It's beyond what you can ever think. No eye has seen, no ear heard what God will use the shift into your life to move you into. And if God is shaking you right now and you don't know where to go, I want you to know something. God is not surprised by the shaking. God doesn't need a plan B. God doesn't need a plan C because he'll take the shaking. He'll work it into his plan and do something far greater than you can do on your own. Could you clap your hands to Jesus, somebody? Second thing, they said number two. Second thing is it will, the earthquakes, what they'll do is they will, God will use them to advance his kingdom. He will use it to advance his kingdom. You see, it was, you don't always go into something because of something you've done wrong. There are times that things will happen to you because of everything you've done right. Don't you think for a second that people's rejection is based upon something that you did wrong? Because God has to sometimes bring you into the right circle to catapult you to the next dimension. There are times that certain jobs might have to thrust you out a little bit because it's thrusting you into where God wants you to go into next. Ask Job. Remember what the Lord said about Job to Satan? He said, have you considered? Have you considered my servant Job? There's none in the land like him. Do you know that Satan has to get permission from God before he comes into your life? I don't think you caught that. And the reason, because if God permitted him to do something into your life, that means that Satan has to work for him. And no matter what the enemy brings into your life, it has this way that God can take it and work it for the good. And so we see in Acts 16 that they didn't just go to prison, but there was a whole family that was baptized as a result of them coming into this place that an earthquake happened in their life. Because God uses opposition to advance his kingdom. We see it in Philippians chapter 1 verse 12 through 14. It says, the apostle Paul, I would ye should understand. You know I just use King James Version probably, don't you? Saying ye. That the things which happened unto me, it's definitely King James. Have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the, all the place. Do you hear that? He said, my chains are in Christ. He said, I want you to understand something. What happened to me? This, this earthquake that's come into my life where I'm behind bars and in a place I wouldn't plan for anybody. He says, I want you to understand something. This very same dilemma is advancing the kingdom of God. He said that all my bonds in Christ, they're, they're manifest. It is apparent to everybody around me that this is not because of something that I've done wrong. But this is so the advancement of God's kingdom could continue to go forward. Things are not falling apart in the Apostle Paul's life. Things are actually falling into place. God is strategically putting pieces into place to advance his kingdom. And it was the same thing that happened in Acts chapter 8. There was tribulation that came to the church. And the same tribulation that came to the church pushed the church out of Jerusalem to go to other areas outside of Jerusalem to stop trying to have a mega church in Jerusalem and go spread the gospel around the world. Did it, but it took persecution to push them out of their comfort zone. It took an earthquake to shake them out of where they were at and push them forward into where God wanted to take them to. Because trouble will position you in ways that your intellect will not choose to take you into. 
You may lose a job because you're an application away from meeting someone who has been praying for a sign from God at the job you're supposed to have. It's about the advancement of the kingdom. The car wreck that you got into brought you in contact with a backslider. The part that you had to take back to the store that wouldn't fix on your lawnmower brought you in contact with someone who needed to hear about Jesus. I do not believe that anything just happens. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. You're moving, but I come to tell you this morning, you are moving on mission. God knows exactly where you are at. And life's surprises are often opportunities to send you to a new place to advance the kingdom of God. If you're going to help God advance his kingdom, could you clap your hands to Jesus and say, God, I'm available. Third thing, third thing, musicians come, I'm almost through. So we see that God will use it to advance his kingdom. We'll see that God will use it also to develop us, doesn't want us to exit too soon. But not only does he use it to develop us, and not only does he use it to advance his kingdom, But the third thing that I love that God can use wounds and pain and the thing that I feel like pushes me further back from where I'm trying to get to in God, I love it because he uses it to restore my soul. I don't know how you do it, God, but you're just so great that you know you can do it. I don't know how you can take the wounds of life in those very same situations to pour the balm of Gilead on those wounds at the same time. I don't know how he does it, but I just know that he can. And before I continue to teach a little bit from this text, I want you to know that if you have ever been wounded, you're in the right place. If you have ever had people hurt you and push you out of their lives and do you wrong and backstab you and you feel like you're all alone in life, I want you to know you are not alone in this life and you have got an auditorium full of people that are here to back you up and help you and hold your hand on the journey and help you take a next step. But Watch this. It says, in he... In verse 33 and 34, it was the jailer, he. He took them the same hour of the night and he washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he, the jailer, had brought them into his house, he set food before them. He, the man in charge of their bondage, he One of the causes for them staying in this jail. He, one of the same persons that participated in continuing the earthquakes of life in their life. He was the one that washed their wounds. He was the one that set food before them and strengthened them. Because God can use opposition for restoration. The jailer oversaw him being restrained would be the very same one to attribute to them being restored. We could say that and go home right now. He washes the wounds. He feeds the apostles. What are you saying, Lavelle? The very same strategy the enemy seeks to use for your shaking. God will use it to strengthen you. The faith that you lost, the situation, the trials, the earthquakes that come in life that cause you to seemingly lose your faith, the things that have happened from you, from people, 
unanswered prayers where your heart is sick the hope in your life that has been broken whatever caused that I just want you to know is that one trial that was the one trial away from you being restored I don't know how he does it but he's so good that he just uses these things that come against me and even though he may not have been the thing the person that sent it he's so wise that he makes it look like it was supposed to happen all along. Ask Joseph. Misunderstood. Ask Joseph. He had dreams in his heart. Did the best that he could at every season of his life. Am I, am I ministering to somebody right now? Did the best that he could to live for God and he felt like he had a call of God and a tug into the direction God wanted him to go into. But those closest to him falsely accused him. Those closest to him stretched him and pulled him from the places of his comfort. And the ones closest to him sold him into slavery to the Midianites. So he does the best that he could in the midst of a situation because even bad things happen to good people. Even bad things happen to Christians. Even bad things happen to those that pay their tithes and serve faithfully at the church. Even bad things happen to good people. So he does the best that he could in the midst of Midian. He's working for Potiphar. But Potiphar's wife doesn't like Joseph very much. Because she wants something from Joseph that Joseph is not willing to give her. And so she falsely accuses Joseph. It is said that people believe that Potiphar didn't actually believe his wife. Because if he had believed her, he probably would have killed Joseph. But rather than killing Joseph and pacifying Potiphar's wife, he sends him to the prison. All he's trying to do is the best that he can. He was administrating the vision of Potiphar doing the best that he can, but nonetheless, he had to go to the prison. He goes to the prison. Eventually, he's the charge of all the prison. God's with him all along the way. You've got to know that. It doesn't matter where you're at. God is with you all along the way. He's in the midst of the prison. And he starts to exercise and develop a gifting that you don't see him exercise a lot before that. And there's people that have dreams. And so because he's an administrator, he knows how to connect with the vision and give you the details of how to go about it. And so he gets the vision. He gets the dream. He interprets it for the butler and the baker. And like any smart person that had a brain would do, he says, when you get out of here, you better remember me. That's my own version of the story. He didn't actually say it like that. It was probably in King James Version how he said it. I'm sure, he's, I'm sure he said shall and these in there. But he says, remember me. Get me out of here. You ever felt like that? You ever been in a place that life hits you so hard? You're like, I don't even care about having everything that I prayed about. Just get me out of this. Just give me some relief. And so he tells them, get me out of here. But I'm thankful that God said, you know what, I know you're asking for something, but I'm not going to give you what you're asking for. Because what happened, Joseph, is you've gotten fatigued. <laughs> Hallelujah, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Joseph, you, Hallelujah. Joseph, you've gotten fatigued. <laughs> you've gotten fatigued from everything that's happened in your life. That now you're not concerned about your dreams anymore. You just want to get out. But Joseph, I love you enough and have a big enough plan for you that I'm going to devote myself. Hallelujah. 
I'm going to devote myself to the promises that I placed and I'm going to tie myself to them beyond what you're asking in this season because I know what you're asking for you don't really mean it and I know what you're asking for you actually want more and I see that there's a fire in your soul there's a bruised weed that I'm not going to break and there's smoking flax that I'm not going to quench but there's something inside of you that I know is there and I have placed there and that you're just too fatigued from everything that's happened into your life that now you have given up on it but I have not given up on the purpose that I've spoken to you but the appointment comes everybody stand the appointment comes say it with me the appointment comes the appointment comes to Joseph because he interprets the dreams well. But there comes a time that Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh has a dream. And there ain't nobody in Egypt that can interpret it. And now all of a sudden... Joseph's appointment has come to date. And the same man that forgot about Joseph for two years says, I forgot about somebody. Do you know that God will allow you to be forgotten about for a season? Do you know that God will permit you to be overlooked for a reason? Because he doesn't want you to go out a second sooner. Because it's not as grand as what he actually has intended. He'll let you be overlooked. He'll let you be forgotten about. Because, David, you have to be overlooked and go back to the shepherd's field. Because you got to wait for that moment where that giant opportunity comes down the way that I'm going to lead you to. I'm ministering to somebody. I feel it in the Holy Ghost. And so Pharaoh calls for Joseph. Joseph interprets the dream. And Joseph is put into second in command to Pharaoh. What are you saying? There's a position in the kingdom God has for you and nobody can take your place. Nobody. No one's going to be promoted ahead of you. You don't have to try to get your way into it. You don't have to try to earn your way into it or try to play favorites. God's going to place you into the position that he's called for you. Because just like for Joseph... Ain't nobody going to occupy this position. You were divinely designed to occupy this position because you are meant to have God's purpose go forward at this time. But watch this. My time's going. He had a dream, but he had to be excommunicated from his brothers. Otherwise, he would have never gone to Egypt where the opportunity came. In Midian, he learned how to steward households well. It was in Midian, listen to me, listen to this. It was in Midian that although Joseph was a good manager and Joseph was a good administer, it was in him, but it was at Midian that it brought it out of him. Because there are things inside of you that it is there. But often it's the shakings and the earthquakes of life and the things you wouldn't plan for yourself that pulls these things out of you. That's why when you're in the midst of the crisis, you'll start to operate in a gift of prophecy like you've never operated before. That's why when it seems like everything has been just shaken in your life, all of a sudden you're preaching with greater anointing than you've ever had before. Because if you look at the illustration of an orange, when you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. What are you saying? When life squeezes you, it's going to squeeze out what is within you. And so the manager was in Joseph, but it took the trial to bring the manager out of Joseph. 
And then he went to prison and he had the capacity to interpret dreams. But he had to go to the prison to interpret the dream. And what are you saying? What Pharaoh needed for this position was he needed somebody to be able to interpret a dream. And he needed somebody to be able to manage the goods of Egypt. I'll say it to you another way. What happened in Midian, what happened in the prison, gave him exactly what he needed to put his name on the resume. It gave him exactly what he needed the experience that he needed the story that he needed the power that he needed the things he didn't plan on himself that other people thrust him into is the very same thing that developed his life and delivered him into the purpose that God had in store for him same people and the same situations and the same things you go through that are responsible for putting you into these prisons <laughs> they're actually serving your release into your purpose you might feel yourself falling forward you might feel yourself shaking with everything going on in your life right now but I've come to encourage you here this Sunday morning that you might be shaking from what's happening in your life, what's happening in your family, what's happening on your job. But you're shaking right into a shift where God releases you into the next place of destiny and a greater dimension of glory than you've ever been to before. The earthquake... What's the earthquake, Lavelle? The earthquake is an entrance. The earthquake is an open door. It's the transition for what God's taking you to. And the earthquake, what is it, Lavelle? It's a chauffeur. It's driving you to your destiny. It's driving you to your purpose because your release is on the way. Your transition is on the way. God's promise is on the way. And all he needed to do was to use an earthquake as a chauffeur for your next entrance of glory. I'm about to pray with you in just a second. And then after that, I'm going to invite you to these altars. And I want to say right now, if it's your first time here, please don't feel uncomfortable to pray. Don't feel uncomfortable to move forward. We're not looking around and judging. We're not looking around saying, oh, she's crying. She must have a lot of problems that she has in her life. Or, man, he has tears coming down his eyes. And, man, he must really have a lot going on. No, no, no. Because can I tell you, we're full of a room of people that are feeling the tremors and we're feeling the earthquake and we're feeling the shaking and you might see us walk real straight like this to the altar but if you can see us in the spirit we're walking like this and so collectively what we invite you to do is just to embrace what God wants to do in your life next and to embrace what he is doing in seasons that are shifting in seismic activity. You can cry, you can shout. In fact, I believe the altar needs to be a messy place. Crying, that's why we got plenty of tissues. Because this at these altars is at minutes. And we all have to do this every day. These altars are admitting. Like Paul and Silas. I can't get myself out of this. I can't get myself into your purpose. This appointment for me to come out is by your setting. And so I'm sitting here and my eyes are towards you, the author and the finisher of my faith, believing you're going to bring me out of this. And if you've been here for 10 years, I know how it is sometimes. It's easy to get comfortable in our walk with God. 
by coming to these altars, we've made the decision like many of us have with our marriages that we're never going to stop dating. I'm always in need of Jesus. And I'm trying to fall in love with him more and more every single day. So Pastor Jones, if you ever give an altar call, it doesn't matter if I feel like I don't have anything in need. I'm just so in love with Jesus that I got to get to the altar and tell him that I love him and tell him that I need him and tell him I'm thankful that I'm saved and tell him that I'm thankful. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice, God. Those in a pit, those in a dungeon, those in a trial, God. Lord, you're going to bring them out. Would you give them strength? Would you give them power? Would you give them peace, God? Would you give them the courage to move forward, God, when life seems to push them back, God? Would you give them the faith to believe beyond what they can see, what they can imagine, God? Because you're working beyond the surface. You're working beyond the scenes, beyond what the eye can see. You're moving. You're moving. You're working. You're working. You're doing something amazing, and we trust in you to do it. In Jesus' name, now is your opportunity to respond to God's word. Now is your opportunity to come into Jesus' presence and allow him to wash your wounds. Allow him to speak to you. Allow him to perform what he wants to do next. Don't let this shaking deter you. Let it shift you into what God wants to do.
Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost right here, right now. Hallelujah. Now listen, here's what happens. When you're in the prison, when you've been bound and beaten and your feet are in stocks, what happens is we get self-absorbed. We just want out. I just want it to stop. You have to understand how mature Paul is because Paul is human just like us. And what most of us do is when the prison opens, we run out. Oh, thank God. And we got a testimony. And we run past the jailer. Because you weren't put in the prison just for a testimony. You were put in the prison for the jailer. And if you're not careful, you get so selfish and self-absorbed that you run out that open door and miss the jailer. Because we just want it to be over. We just want to be whole. We just want to be healed. We just want our marriage put back together. But you were placed in that prison to win a whole family. And Paul has the maturity. Even though he wants out just like everybody else, he has the maturity to understand, I need to look around right now. Because somebody's been watching me. Somebody's been watching my praise in the struggle. Somebody has been watching my faithfulness, even though it appears that God has abandoned me. And he's standing near as the prison guard grabs a sword to thrust it through himself because he knows he's failed. And Paul said, we're all here. We're all here. Hallelujah. Somebody's been watching you and you're shaking. Somebody's been watching you and you're trial. You need to look for them right now. Hallelujah. Who can I help? Who can I minister to? Who can I strengthen? Saint Joseph that was sold into slavery, forgotten in the prison, has his own brothers who sold him come to him. And then he realizes, oh, you meant it for evil. You tried to hurt me. You tried to take advantage of me. You were jealous of me. But God intended this for good and the saving of many. You need to look around. Somebody in your own household has been watching your struggle. And they're ready to welcome Jesus into their life. Hallelujah. Hmm. Because when we're hurting and we're overwhelmed, we just, I want out. And we don't see that we're going to run past somebody who has no hope without us, who can't make sense of life without our message. And so I want you to get your eyes off your problem right now. I want you to get your eyes off your problem. I want you to say, God, give me discernment to see who's been watching me struggle in silence. Who's been watching me remain faithful even though it's been difficult. Because let me tell you something, your healing is not complete until you see that person. Your deliverance is not complete until you realize who's been watching and who needs your testimony and who needs you to preach to them even though they've been your captor. Even though they put your feet in stocks. Hallelujah. So right now I want you to just use the spirit of discernment. I want you to find somebody else to pray for. Hallelujah. I want you to find somebody to pray for. God, lead me. Guide me. Show me. Show me who I can pray for. Because here's what I'm going to tell you. Your healing and your deliverance is bound in theirs. He's going to get both. He's not just going to deliver you. He's going to deliver the jailer too and his whole family. That's it. Go ahead and lay hands on them. 
begin to pray in the spirit. Father, I pray right now, not just for my deliverance, but for our deliverance, God. Not just for my healing, but for theirs as well, God. Oh, mighty God. For the Holy Ghost to follow them. To deliver them, to strengthen them, oh God. Yes, Lord. Don't just save me. Don't just deliver me, God. But let me see the one who I need to deliver on my way out. That's it. Believe it. Pray for it. Receive it. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, Holy Ghost. Empower me. Strengthen me so that I can strengthen someone else. Empower me, oh God. of God in this place. Mighty presence of God. Put your head on a swivel and say, Lord, let me see them. Let me recognize them. Lead me to them. Guide me, oh God. In this season of deliverance, let me take somebody with me out of the prison, out of darkness, out of ignorance, out of bondage.
let me remind you of something. That the Bible says after 10 terrible plagues in Egypt, most people miss this. After the firstborn were killed. The Bible says that when Israel left Egypt, a mixed multitude left with them. In other words, it wasn't just to get Israel out of bondage, but that some of the Egyptians, after seeing Yahweh destroy the gods that they had admired, they said, we're going with you because we know that your God is the God of all power and all authority. There were Egyptians who left and went through the Red Sea and embraced Yahweh because of the power of God. Your deliverance is not just about you. It's about who you can bring with you. for what you did here today. Thank you for works that you've started. Thank you for works that you've continued. And thank you for works that you've finished, God, here today. Some of us, we're entering into a new season. We feel you shift in us, God. And you know exactly where we're at. Even when we don't seem like we can see you, we know you can see exactly where we are. And I thank you for it, Jesus. I thank you for it, Jesus.
If you're praying, please ignore anything that I'm saying right now and continue to pray. Let's all stand as we close this out. Every service, every single service, we try to do what I'm about to do. Because we realize there's a lot of different walks that people are on in their relationship with Jesus. One thing that we believe about our relationship with God is that it's a journey. What is a journey, Lavelle? It's one step in front of the other. For some of you today, and it's fine, and I feel like if this is your step, you're exactly where you need to be to take this step. This step is to be baptized in Jesus' name. Recently, we've had, last Sunday, I believe we had six or seven people baptized in Jesus' name after our Sunday service. Yesterday, some of you have might have already seen it. Pastor Jones met someone up here to be baptized in Jesus' name. Who's this for? Well, Peter was talking to people in Acts chapter 2. They were religious. They loved God. But they'd never been baptized in Jesus' name. There was other people in Acts 19 that had been baptized, but they'd never been baptized in Jesus' name. And so you're like, why is it important to be baptized in Jesus' name? Scripture says in Acts 4, there's no other name. Like we sang, we're singing Scripture. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. What's that name? It's the name of Jesus. Because it's Jesus that died for your sins. And you might think, well, Lavelle, that sounds great. But I don't have any clothes to change into. And I've got plans after this. I've got good news for you. We've got clothes you can change into. You might think, well, I, cold water kind of, it might make my blood pressure go up because it constricts my blood vessels a little bit. Well, we've got warm water to keep your blood vessels open. You may think, well, Lavelle, I don't have all day to do this. Well, to be honest with you, it takes about five minutes to get in that water and get out in the name of Jesus. So really, there's no excuse because today is the day of salvation. You and I, friend, we're not promised tomorrow. So let's not take it lightly. Jesus died so that way you can receive this atonement. He died so you can receive this. Don't worry about going the rest of your life to try to get it together before you come to God. That's what baptism is about. It's not about getting you wet. It's about washing away your past and saying hello to your future. And again, you might say, I don't know where to go. Ladies, can you wave your hand? You just come down there and talk to them and they'll take you back where you need to. And this is not like, oh, you're a sinner. We're all sinners that need a grace. <laughs> Amen. So take this step here right now. Go ahead and start making your way out to these wonderful ladies. Nicest people you ever meet in your life, by the way. And we're thankful for the water baptism team. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Gosh, an amazing service. Again, if you're praying, continue to pray. Creative team interest meeting. Out these doors to the right. First steps, out those doors to the left. And as always, we will see you tomorrow night at Monday Night Prayer. 7.30, come and go. God bless you. Have a good day. Have a great, great week.